Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Things We Said Today, a weekly Beatle news podcast. And I'm Steve Marinucci, Beatles examiner columnist and many other examiner columnists and many other writers, uh, writers of many other things. Um, and uh, I'm uh, one of the hosts of this show. And my co-host sitting across the country from me is uh, Ken Michaels, host of Every Little Thing. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. Hi, Hi Ken, and we have a very special guest on the phone today, on our on our conference call line. It's uh, and he's in another area of the country. He's in New Orleans. It's uh, Bruce Spicer. Welcome, Bruce. South. Yeah, glad to be on the show. Okay, and the the occasion of Bruce's Bruce being here is the digital publication of his. The, actually, it's the digital update of his um, uh, VJ book uh, book on VJ Records. Songs, pictures, and stories of the fabulous Beatle records on VJ. And Bruce, um, let's talk about let's talk about that first of all. Um, well, let's go back to the original book. Um, when you did the original book, what was the idea, and and what uh, what did you do with the first publication? Well, uh, with the, you know, with the... my, yeah, my my thinking at the time was that I was going to do a book that was going to be a little footnote in Beatles history, and that would be my one and only book, and. Um, I had had, and I know you can't make this stuff up, but my record collection had been attacked by roaches, which had eaten the spines of my album jackets. And so I wanted to start replacing the records, and I wanted to make sure I was getting the original records as they came out, not, you know, reissues or counterfeits. And so I read up a little bit on what was out there and talked to record dealers. But what I was hearing about the VJ records, the very first Beatle releases in the U.S., just didn't make any sense. And being an attorney, I'd ask people, and they'd say, yep, it's in every book. And I thought, well, what if every book's wrong? (laughs) And I thought, if the Beatles were on VJ and Capitol at the same time, certainly the companies must have sued each other. In fact, they did. Being an attorney, it was easy for me to get copies of four different lawsuits involving the companies. And from there... I decided I would do a book. And uh, the idea was I wanted to do a book that I would want to buy if it were available. But because it wasn't available, I'd go and write it. And that was the idea. I would use, you know, nice glossy paper, full color throughout the book, you know, all kind of things that no publisher would let me do. And so for that reason, I self-published the book, did a production run of about 5,000 copies, and, uh, you know, after a while, it sold out, and next thing you know, it's going on eBay and Amazon secondary markets for you know three, four, five, six, seven hundred dollars a pop. Wow! So uh, people said, "Well, Bruce, you need to reprint the book," and I was like, "Well, there are some problems there because the printing plates that were used for this book when it came out 15 years ago were destroyed in Hurricane Katrina." And even if they hadn't been destroyed, they probably would be outdated anyway because of the changes in technology. And it just wasn't economically feasible to do a small print run for the book. And some of my younger customers who said, Bruce, you know, I have your other books, but I just can't swing 400 for this book. Why don't you put it out as a digital book? I mean, I'd never even read a digital book at that point, but, you know, I thought, look, I love playing records on a turntable, but when I'm on vacation... I love the fact that my iPhone has all my Beatle tunes on it. So why not go digital? And I talked it over with my graphic designer, and we naively decided we could do it. And lo and behold, we did. Hmm. Bruce, before you talk about um, the Beatles' involvement with VJ, why don't you just give a brief history of what the label was like before VJ signed the Beatles? Because it's really fascinating that they they really started out as as an R&B label. Yes, they, uh, it was actually started by uh, Vivian Carter, and she set it up as a, her R&B and gospel label. Her true love was in gospel music. She did a, a gospel radio show. And so their first recording artist, you had somebody like Jimmy Reed and the Spaniels, but you also had gospel recordings very early on. She was from Gary, Indiana. They moved up to Chicago uh, put their building on what's known as Record Row with Chess and a few of the other record companies, and they did a really good job. They had some number one R&B hits, and something interesting started happening. You know, they were very good at marketing black music to black people, and then they'd come up with a song like Raindrops by D. Clark, which crossed over to the pop charts, 
and VJ began getting interested in the idea of, well, you know, if we can sell black music to black people and black music to white people, maybe we could sell white music to white people. And lo and behold, uh, they ventured into that, and they did it in a big way. Two singles that came out at about the same time. The first one was a group of four white male singers that had been turned down by Capitol Records. And before you go, oh, yeah, I know, it was the Four Seasons. And Sherry did extremely well on the pop charts, but interestingly enough, it was a number one R&B hit because it was on VJ, and the black DJs assumed it was a black vocal group. Wow. So the Four Seasons had tremendous success all across the board. And then the other one was Frank Ifield's I Remember You, which Capitol Records had turned down. Capitol was a subsidiary of EMI, and they had a right of first refusal of all EMI artists, including Frank Ifield on the EMI Columbia label, and they turned it down. And there was an attorney in New York named Paul Marshall who represented both VJ and EMI. And after everybody seemed to turn down Frank Ifield, he got the idea of, well, gee, why don't we put it on VJ? And they did, and it got to be a number five hit. The importance of that was when Capitol and everybody else turned down the Beatles, uh, Paul Marshall thought, well, let's see if VJ can do anything with the Beatles. And so, you know, while various people have claimed to have gotten the Beatles a record deal with VJ, the bottom line was it was a New York attorney. And those other myths out there are just that, myths. Hmm. What was the initial reaction from the people at VJ when they first heard the Beatles? Did they immediately say, oh, we think that this can go somewhere? Well, I think they were hoping they could do something with it. After all, they got Frank Ifield to number five on the charts. But I think the problem was they just didn't quite know how to market it. They they had no trouble marketing the Four Seasons. Um, but, you know, they took out an ad in Billboard, and uh, you know, the ad was great because it said that the song was going great rhythm and blues, country, western, and pop. Hmm. You know, and in fact, the song was really going nowhere. It did get some airplay in uh, Chicago, which is where VJ was based. Uh, Dick Biondi was with WLS, and he, I believe we could say, would, was the first disc jockey to play the Beatles in America. And uh, Dick Biondi played Please Please Me. The label had the group's name misspelled with two T's, mm -hmm. and they got that spelling, oddly enough, from EMI's New York office, so we can't just blame that on VJ. And Please Please Me sold about maybe 5,700 copies uh, when it came out, it charted not only in Chicago, but it did chart in other markets in California and San Bernardino. Uh, I believe it also charted uh, in uh, San Francisco and, oddly enough, Houston and Miami. It wasn't a big hit, but it did chart. Now, I, I love the fact that you, you bring this up, not just in this book, but in your other books, because we've always been told that WWDC was the first station to break the Beatles yes, in America. Yeah, and they get the credit because they did something very important, and that was that Capitol Records was going to release I Want to Hold Your Hand in mid-January, and uh, WWDC got a copy of the Parlophone single I Want to Hold Your Hand, put it on the air on December 17th, and with listener response being great, uh, they started playing it, and record stores started calling up Capitol saying, look, we want the record out. Capital's initial decision was, well, you know, we'll sue you if you don't stop playing the record, uh, WWDC. And they said, hey, fellas, it's a hit. Are you nuts? Mm -hmm. So Capital pushed up the release date. So what WWDC did was very important, but they were not the first. The first would have been Dick Biondi at WLS. Hmm. Right. Interesting. Did VJ really know what they had, Bruce? I don't did think they... they did initially. I think they would have been very happy if they had gotten the top ten hit out of Please Please Me. And um, and the interesting thing about Paul Marshall, the attorney who represented both EMI and VJ, was he did wear his VJ hat for the negotiations for a while. And what he basically said was, okay, EMI, if VJ is able to get hits with the Beatles, you know, they should get something for this. So the contract was for five years for Please Please Me and Ask Me Why. But he added a writer to the contract, giving VJ a right of first refusal for the length of the contract. That's five years. So think about it. 
in a different world, Sergeant Pepper could have been on VJ, but of course it was not to be. So you know, VJ puts out "Please Please Me." It does okay. Then they put out "From Me to You," and they run into a couple of problems. One of them is Dick Biondi is fired by WLS right before the record comes out, so he's not going to play it because he's not there. And Del Shannon comes out with a cover version of "From Me to You." Hmm. And, of course, if you're a disc jockey back in 1963, who are you going to play? From Me to You by Del Shannon, who had a runaway number one hit called Runaway, <laughs> or From Me to You by a group called The Beatles on an R&B label. So you can see the problem. So Del Shannon, in most markets, got the airplay rather than The Beatles. And the first Lennon-McCartney song to chart nationally uh, was From Me to You, as recorded by Del Shannon. And once again, there were pockets of the country that played from me to you, uh, on the West Coast in particular. You had it in Seattle, San Bernardino again, and then later on, KRLA in Los Angeles began playing from me to you. And of course, the ultimate irony is that in August of 63, when Capitol Records once again was turning down the Beatles and saying they weren't suitable for the American market, in their own backyard, KRLA, for me to you, was a top 40 hit. <laughs> so, well, you know, you, you couldn't make this stuff up if you tried. Hmm. Do you know why the, the California stations were more receptive to playing the Beatles? I really don't know, and it is interesting to see that that's where it occurred, and it, it just must have been that some of the disc jockeys there, just for whatever reason, like the sound of it. Uh, I think one of the... the fascinating things when you try to think well when please please me came out what else was new at that time and you can see why program directors may have balked at the song you had um you know don't be afraid little darling by steve lawrence who was coming off a number one hit with go away little girl you know you had mecca by gene pitney who had a bunch of hits and uh, Mr. Bassman by Johnny Symbol, you know, a good doo-wop novelty song. Mm -hmm. and, and nothing sounded like Please Please Me at that time, and I think the program directors might not have known what to make of it. That's funny because later on um, in 64 and 65, the East Coast stations, well, I was in the Boston area at the time, and uh, Boston was picking up on the imports, on, on uh, the stuff that hadn't been released here. Yeah, it, um, and hopefully we'll do a do more shows together but you know the she loves you actually broke in worcester massachusetts uh in december uh and the really crazy thing is and one of the stories i love telling is she loves you got to number nine on the charts which you think wow that's really impressive but number one on that same chart it was based on listener requests was i'll get you by the beatles <laughs> wow so i remember you telling me that yeah, so there are a lot of strange things, you know, going on. It's not the simple as Paul loves to say, you know, please, please me, flop for me to you, flop, she loves you, flop. Yeah, nationally, yes, they were flops, but there were pocket markets in the U.S. that really recognized the talent of the Beatles early on. Mm -hmm. um, VJ was pretty much a family label, though, wasn't it? It Beatles. was in many ways. Uh, the company's name, VJ, came from Vivian Carter and her husband, James Bracken, so mm -hmm. VJ. And uh, Vivian's brother, Tolly Carter, was head of A&R. And then they brought in Ewart Abner, and Ewart Abner was like family to them once he came into the company. He was a promotional genius. He did many wonderful things for VJ. But ultimately, he caused VJ's downfall and cost him the four seasons in the Beatles. And you might say, well, wow, how did he do that? Well, the problem was that Ewart Abner had a gambling problem. Mm. And he had heavy gambling debt. And in order to pay off his gambling debt, he took money out of VJ and paid off his gambling debts. And this cash flow problem made it impossible for VJ to pay royalties to the Four Seasons, royalties on Frank Ifield, royalties on the Beatles, the factories that press the records, you name it, they couldn't pay it. And, of course, that has ultimately led to the label's downfall. They owed royalties on the Beatles of about $850, 
and uh, certainly they would have been in a better position to keep the Beatles if they had paid their royalties. Well, you know, uh, you say in your book that the the contract that VJ had with the Beatles lasted through October of '64. Well, that was a settlement agreement. Yes, in other words, the contract was a five-year contract, and then EMI and Capital took the position that VJ had breached its contract by failing to pay royalties, and there was a lot of litigation involving it. And VJ, to be blunt didn't have as good a lawyer as capital in the early stages of the litigation. So VJ was at a disadvantage. And because of that, VJ really had to reach a settlement with capital. And under the settlement agreement, VJ could continue releasing the 16 Beatles songs that they had through October 15, 1964. And then at that time, they would lose all rights to the Beatles. And it seemed like a reasonable deal at the time because, look, who dreamed that past October 15, 1964, anyone would care about the early recordings of the Beatles, or maybe even the Beatles for that matter, as a group? Right. Mm-hmm. Of course, that agreement was reached on April Fool's Day, 1964. Wow. It's kind of interesting, kind of like you said, if VJ had remained solvent as a company, yeah. you know, they could have kept the Beatles for five years. I think they may have been in a similar position like Sun Records and Elvis, that capital may have come to them and said, look, you don't have the production capability to get these records out and the promotional clout to do all this. We do, and we will you know, buy the Beatles contract from you for X dollars. And I think that may have happened just as likely an outcome of VJ just saying, hey, we think we can get it done. Thank you very much, Capital, but we're going to stick with it. And, you know, if you're into alternate realities, I'm sure you could come up with some fascinating timelines of, how things could have been different if only Ewood Abner had done a little bit better at his gambling. Mm-hmm. Right. I, you know, I, I, just thinking about it, I, I, I don't think things. A lot of things would have happened. I think they were better off going where the, you know, well, things, think, things worked out for the best. I think you're right in that. It's like people go, "Oh, the poor Beatles failed the deck audition." Thank God they failed the deck <laughs> audition. <laughs> right. That's right. You know, Mike Smith would have been producing them. That first single could have been Love of the Love Back with Red Sails and the Sunset. <laughs> you know? So, I mean, you know, it was meant to be that the Beatles would have George Martin, and it was probably meant to be that the Beatles would end up on Capitol Records after all. Yep. It just so happens that good fortune always seemed to go their way. It did, you know. But if you're a record collector... Boy, the fact that they're on VJ is just a bonanza of fun stuff because you've got records where the group's mis- you know names misspelled with two T's. You've got all these colorful albums that they put out. You know, and it just is a fascinating area to collect. So you know, I'm glad that they didn't end up on Capitol initially. You know, I think this was the way it was really meant to be. It made for uh, you know a very colorful story and. Plus the fact that by being on multiple labels, uh, you had the unbelievable push in January of 64 where you had the Capitol single, I Want to Hold Your Hand, the Swan single, She Loves You, the VJ single, Please Please Me, all racing up the charts at the same time, you know, one, two, three in most markets across the U.S. Mm -hmm. So it really helped Beatlemania explode, you know, with several different songs coming out at the same time being marketed by three different record companies. I know you talk about it in your book, but explain to our listeners why there was a need for VJ to create the Tali label. Yes, um, you know, what happened was you had this we mentioned the Capital single, you know, the Swan single, the VJ single, and VJ was trying to rush out as many Beatle records as they could. So they weren't going to get a new single from EMI obviously. So, okay, well, let's put Twist and Shout out as a single. It's a great song. But if we put it out on VJ, well, I mean, we still are high on the charts with the Please Please Me single. So they created a new label, Tolly, for the Twist and Shout single. And also they decided, well, we'll use this as kind of our non-R&B artists as well. And so the label put out about, I think, 45, 46 different singles uh, through the you know 13 months it was in existence. Um, but um, their follow-up single to Twist and Shout was Do You Want to Know a Secret, which came out on VJ, and the follow-up to that, Love Me Do, came out on Tolly. 
Hmm. So the idea was, you know, not to confuse disc jockeys. You know how dumb disc jockeys are, right, guys? <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so they wanted to keep it simple so the disc jockeys could, okay, now we've got the Tolly single. Okay, a new VJ single. Oh, a new Tolly single. So the strategy worked really well. Those four records, each of them, you know, sold over a million copies and would have been certified gold except for the fact that VJ did not allow the RIAA to inspect their books. Hmm. Interesting. Now, with with the um, introducing the Beatles album, why were there two versions that came out? Very good question. And the answer is, you've asked the right person and attorney, legal reasons. <laughs> and that was that the original album, in America, you had 12 songs on an album rather than 14. So VJ dropped Please Please Me and Ask Me Why. After all, the single wasn't that big a hit. And they changed the name of the album from Please Please Me to Introducing the Beatles. Well, that was all good and well, and when they were ready to release the album in early 64, they contacted the different music publishers who own the mechanical license fees you know, of all the songs on the albums. And as it was, only two of the songs were controlled by Beechwood Music, which was the U.S. branch of Beechwood and Armacord Music in the U.K., which had done the first Beatles single. So P.S. I Love You and Love Me Do were with Beechwood Music, which was a subsidiary of Capitol Records, essentially. So when V.J. requested permission to license the song, Beechwood said no. And V.J. had a problem because they had press like you know 80,000 copies of Introducing the Beatles with these two songs on it. And they went to court over it, and they lost in court and realized they would probably lose on appeal. So therefore, they dropped Love Me Do and T.S.I. Love You from the album and instead put back Please Please Me and Ask Me Why. And that's why the change was made. Strictly but then how legal. would they have the right to put out the Love Me Do, P.S.I. Love You single? As part of their settlement reached on April Fool's Day, they got the right to release those two songs as a single. So okay. that was part of the settlement agreement. There were a lot of there were a lot of uh, copies of uh, introducing the Beatles that uh, uh, that were uh, considered bootlegs, but actually they weren't really bootlegs, were they? They were outright counterfeits. Uh, you mean the ones that came out in the seventies? Or well, no, I'm talking about. I mean, some of those originated with VJs themselves, didn't they? Well, in the seventies, uh, what happened was that. Uh, one of the former VJ employees, Randy Wood, who was president of the company for a while, still had high-quality color separations for the album cover. And he didn't have the master tapes, but uh, they put out counterfeits, and the covers looked really beautiful. And they were you know, stereo covers, and the disc inside played mono, but never mind. Um, so <laughs> yeah. these, you know, if introducing the Beatles could have been certified, I bet the counterfeit introducing the Beatles would probably be double, triple, quadruple platinum, because there were just millions of them out there now. Oh yeah, they were every I remember they were everywhere. But but you know, V J was a it was a fun label. I mean of course you had uh that album and then you had this silly album called Jolly Watt, the Bring Beatles and Frank Ifield on stage. Mm-hmm. Now once again, I know you're gonna say, Well Bruce, why those four songs? And why any by Frank Ifield? What's this about? Once again, it's strictly a legal matter. VJ, under their contract with EMI, had the right to release these songs on singles, which they did, you know, the first two singles. And then they did not exercise their right of first refusal in a timely fashion for the Please Please Me album. So they were advised by their attorney that the only thing that they really had the right to release by the Beatles was the four songs that were on their first two singles. And so those four songs ended up on the Jolly Watt album, along with eight Frank Ifield songs, which had come out on four VJ singles. They had a similar agreement with Frank Ifield, licensing agreement. So essentially their attorney told them, if you release an album with these four Beatles songs and these eight Frank Ifield songs, you're in the clear. Capital EMI cannot stop you from doing that. So the Jolly Watt album was a fallback album of, hey, this is what happens in the event we can't put out Introducing the Beatles anymore. 
So and, that's and, what that was about. And what was really funny is nobody at the time knew that they had done I Remember You. <laughs> the Beatles had, had done it uh, themselves. That's correct. They played it in concert. And mm-hmm. Of course, I always, when I give a talk, and I always like asking people, how many people remember Frank Ifield? And very few people raise their hand. I say, but he remembers you. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And that's then we right. play, I remember you. Yeah, I anyway. know. <laughs> so, you know, you have that. And DJ was very clever marketing, you know. So they come out with the Jolly Watt album, try to look hip with an English statesman wearing a Beatles wig on the cover. And now they've got a problem. They've reached a settlement agreement with Capitol, and they can put out Beatles music to October 15th, but they can't get any new songs. So VJ has the idea, Jay Lasker, who was their VP, says, why don't we come out with an album combining Beatle and Four Seasons songs? This would really be great. And they contact EMI and George Martin and basically are told, no, we won't allow that. So VJ goes, gee, that's too bad. And then they say, you know what? Introducing the Beatles, we rushed that cover out. And maybe we can, if we had a better cover, maybe we could sell more copies of that album. So they get the idea to do a magazine type cover with a gatefold. Looks like a you know teenage mm-hmm. magazine. And um, Capital and EMI say, no, no, you can't do that. The settlement prohibits it. And VJ says we disagree. They go to court, and the court rules that VJ has the right to package their albums in any way they want. So that means they can package introducing the Beatles in a different cover and call it. Songs, Pictures, and Stories of the Fabulous Beatles. Right. Hmm. Which they do. And that answers the question that you were probably thinking, well, when they did Songs, Pictures, why didn't they put From Me to You on it? Why didn't they do something different? Because they couldn't. But when they did that successfully, they realized, you know what? We can still put out that Beatles Four Seasons album. We just can't put it out on one record. So they got the idea to make it a double gatefold album, and they would pop in a Four Seasons album, Golden Hits of the Four Seasons in one flop, and on the other flop, introducing the Beatles. Right. So, perfectly legal. And uh, that's why you have the Beatles versus the Four Seasons, the way it was done. It's fascinating. It's all for legal reasons. Yeah, you know, it, 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 you know I joke about it and say that, uh, that, you know, it really took someone who was a Beatles fan and an attorney and a CPA to do this book. Because... <laughs> You had so many accounting and royalty issues and legal issues and the whole bit. So, you know, it it wasn't a simple story. And I think one of the reasons that the stories were incorrectly told for so long was that, you know, people didn't have the background or the resources necessary to really find out what really happened. What um, uh, what did you add to the, to the um, digital book that isn't in the original proof? Well, every chapter has new information and images. Uh, You know, for example, as we talked on earlier in the show about how the first two VJ singles did well in certain markets, uh, a lot of that information only recently that I've become aware of because of the Internet where you've got, you know, a new site that tells people, send in your record surveys from local surveys, and they're putting together this big data bank of local record surveys. And so through that data bank, I was able to determine other markets where the records were being played. Uh, You know, so you had things like that going on. And then tons of new documents, uh, a lot of legal documents um, involving VJ. And for instance, one of the things that I got fairly recently was a telegram showing the, you know, the release date of Please Please Me. And then you know, things where they would send, I mean, fun stuff, a, a telegram where Jay Lasker of VJ writes Billboard and says, you know, how come Capitol Records is getting uh, a seal by their album, Meet the Beatles, as a, you know, million-dollar seller, and introducing the Beatles isn't? Are we being discriminated against? Of course, the answer to that is no, you haven't opened up your books to the RIAA. So, <laughs> you know, for that reason, you're not going to be in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. But those were the, you know, the types of things, a lot of a lot of new images and tweaking of things. A couple things, Bruce. Um, how did uh, VJ lose out on getting the single for She Loves You? Well, what happened was that, remember we talked about Ewood Abner's gambling problem. Yeah. VJ 
was not paying royalties. They weren't even preparing royalty statements. And so EMI sent them a telegram, copy of which is in the book, on August, I think it was August 8th, telling them that um, because you haven't paid any royalties on the Beatles or Frank Ifield, you know, immediately this manufacture and distribution of these songs. And I think at the time, you know, they were probably more concerned about Frank Ifield than the Beatles, because Ifield at least had, had a little bit of action in the States with I Remember You. So for that reason, VJ was told, you know, the agreement's over. And VJ really didn't, they had more problems at that time than a group that didn't sell well. So they just didn't worry about the Beatles. They didn't contact EMI and say, oh, wait, we'll pay the royalties or anything. They just kind of let it slide. And so that meant that Capitol Records could now release recordings by Frank Ifield and the Beatles. And so Dave Dexter was sent a copy of Frank Ifield's latest single, I'm Confessing, and the Beatles' latest single, She Loves You. And he listened to both and determined that one of them would not be suitable for the American market and one would be a hit. And, of course, Frank Ifield's I'm Confessing was picked to be the capital single. <laughs> and they passed on the Beatles. And so because of that, once again, Transglobal, EMI's American subsidiary needed to find a home for the She Loves You single, and Swan Records ended up with it. Swan had a relationship with EMI because uh, Freddie Cannon had had some hits over there, you know, like Way Down Yonder in New Orleans and Palisades Park had been hits over in England on EMI's top rank and stateside labels. And the owner of Swan, Bernie Vanek, had actually been in England and he knew who the Beatles were. So when he was given the opportunity to put out a Beatles single, he grabbed it. And you might say, well, what happened with Swan? Well, EMI realized the Beatles' potential, even if Capital didn't. And so the Swan agreement was limited to two years, those two songs only for release in the singles format only, with a writer stating that if the record sold 50,000 copies within four months, that uh, Swan would get the next single. And, of course, She Loves You initially flopped, and when EMI approached Swan about saying, hey, can we ch cancel that clause, Swan did. And so that's how Capital then had the full rights to the Beatles at that time, or at least they thought they did. You know, but hmm. VJ had some very good legal arguments that they made and may have been successful if their attorney had not screwed up initially in the litigation. So it's a crazy stuff. The short story is that if I would have been representing VJ, I would have said, look, it's true we owe you $7,000 on Frank Ifield and 800 on the Beatles, but you owe us 20000 in royalties. So, Judge, why should we pay them 7800 when they owe us 20000 hmm. And That would have been a really good argument and very well could have carried the day. Too bad you weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good thing because the Beatles ended up with capital. That's right. <laughs> You know, and it's, it's fun stuff. Like, uh, you know, the, one of the things that I love about, a few things I really love about the digital book, and don't get me wrong, I love hard-covered books, but you can expand the images. So, you know, if you're looking at a document or a record label and you want to see some detail, you can expand it on an iPad very easily or on a computer. And so you get to see that detail. The book has a lot of internal links to where when I'm describing something that's on another part of the book, you just touch the page number that I list there, and it takes you immediately to that page. And if you want to get back to where you were reading, I have what's called the get back key. Hmm. And it takes you back to where you once belonged, or at least where you were once reading. Uh, those features, and there's some external links too, where it'll take you to the internet for external links. So, you know, those features are fun. The other thing I love about it is there's nothing more frustrating than you know, you work hard on a book for several months or a year. You're about to put it out. It's at the printer. The presses are rolling. It hasn't gone on sale yet. Or, you know, it's on the ship heading back to the States, and you discover something new that would have been great to put in the book. Mm -hmm. And I had had the book finished, and I was going to have it come out in about a week after Beetlefest, or the Fest for Beetle fans, as it's now known in Chicago. And I was there, and while I was there, I came across some leads on things, 
So three new images get added to the book at a time when if it were a printed book, I couldn't have added. And that was the actual an actual gold record award of Twist and Shout, an actual gold record award for Please Please Me, and a picture of Ringo holding a Tali gold record award back in London with Brian Epstein standing next to him. Hmm. And, nice. I mean, and, and those added a lot to the story. And I would not have been able to do that but for a digital book. Now, here's the other thing that's cool. So the books come out. People have bought it from my website. They have a digital book. Let's say a month from now, something new comes out that's really great that would have been perfect for the book, and it's of such a magnitude that I feel I have to do it. Well, I do a version 1.1 of the book, and I send emails to people who have already bought the book and say, here's the link for version 1.1 of the book. And now they get the updated book. So, you know, these are things you can't do with a printed book. And, uh, you know, I'm really getting into the format and seeing its its advantages, just as I still play records and I still listen to music on my iPhone. So there's a place in the world for both. Right. People get people get some extra stuff if they order it directly from you, correct? That's correct. Uh, we have a what I call a signature card because I know collectors like stuff, and I sign the back of the card for them, personalize it if they want. A uh, collector's card which shows the different picture sleeves and album covers that VJ used, and most importantly, a bookmark because I don't know about you, but I love having a bookmark for a book. But I haven't quite figured out how to get the bookmark into my iPad yet. <laughs> but Nonetheless, the, the people seem to like that. And, and, of course, I think, you know, it's kind of fun to say, here's a digital book, and if you order through me, you get a bookmark for it. So it's kind of fun marketing tool. Bruce, uh, one last thing. Of, of all the the records that the Beatles what were released on VJ, what are the most valuable and the rarest now? Well, you know, to me, one of the most sought after is going to be the original Please Please Me single with uh, the group's name misspelled, that in near mint condition can go between three, four, five thousand dollars. That's not the most valuable, but to me, because it was the first record with the Beatles' name in it released in America, mm. that to me is the most sought after. However, the original issues of introducing the Beatles are very valuable because what happened was that VJ had the front cover slicks. They were going to put the album out in the summer of '63. And many books say it came out then, but I can assure you it did not come out to January 10, 64. But they did print those cover slicks. Well, they lost the liner notes. They couldn't get them from EMI. So what they did to, to rush the jackets together was they took an inner sleeve, an album inner sleeve, that showed 25 different VJ albums. Nice, colorful thing. And they, in other words, they advertised VJ. So it's known among collectors as the ad back. And they put that on the back cover before they came up with the boring two columns that just list the songs. Mm. But the ad back in stereo in near men is you know, ten to fifteen thousand. And then the other highly collectible one, remember that Jolly Watt album, that silly thing? Mm -hmm. right. it didn't you know, it sold well initially in the sense, you know, V J shipped out like, you know, maybe seventy thousand copies and got returns of like about, you know, fifty thousand. Well, they realized you know, we're getting to October. What can we do? What if we reissue the Jolly Watt album, but we just call it the Beatles and Frank Ifield on stage, and we put the Beatles on the cover? <laughs> and they did that, and it's called the Portrait Album. It's a beautiful blue cover, and uh, it didn't sell that well. People weren't fooled. I remember seeing the album, and I remember being smart enough not to buy it. Of course, I wish I had been stupid enough to buy it <laughs> because go. a near mint stereo copy goes around ten, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars. Wow! So, how many can, copies were made? We don't know on that one. I, you know, I can tell you that on the Beatles versus the Four Seasons, they sold seven hundred and twenty stereo copies. That's pretty rare. That Portrait pretty... covers even less. But I, but when I was doing my research, you know, I found information on every single record but that one hmm. it was as if somebody said some secrets are best remained as secrets so i can't give you any sales figures on the portrait cover but we can tell you it's pretty damn rare it is counterfeited one of the nice things about this book is it shows the legitimate album 
and the counterfeit and explains how to tell the difference. So you don't want to make the mistake of paying $1,000 at a record show for a counterfeit portrait cover. No. And same right. thing with introducing the Beatles. You know, all the all of the things in there tells you how to spot the differences between them. So, you know, the nice thing is, you know, the hardcover book weighs four pounds. You can download the book into your iPad and take your iPad to a record show. Yeah. And it really is very convenient. The other thing, and I was concerned about this, but after downloading the VJ book into my iPad, I reweighed it, and it did not increase in weight. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very happy about that because that was a concern I had. Oh, okay. You, did, there, you, are, you you told me that you are thinking about doing this with the other books. Yes, absolutely. The uh, The first four books I did, and that would be the VJ book, the Capital Singles book, the Capital Albums book, and the Apple book have all sold out. And my thinking was that, you know, once again, rather than going through the inventory and the hassles of redoing a reprint of a book that uses different technology nowadays, why not just put them out as e-books? If somebody wants the hardcover books, they're available in the secondary market. If they don't want to pay that kind of money, they can get the e-book, and plus they have the convenience. So the idea would be that you know, somewhere down the line, you'll be able to just take your iPad on an airplane or to a record show or whatever and go through all these books and... Uh, you know, at some point in time. So I hope everyone doesn't put a gun to me and say, you promised we want them out next year. <laughs> because bear in mind, I'm not just scanning in the old books and putting out a PDF file of the old books. These are completely revised and expanded editions and re-edited as well. One of the things that I really like about this book is that my books have a lot of minutiae in it. You know, what's in the trail-off areas? all these different label variation information. And a lot of people get intimidated by that. But they have tremendously, you know, fun and interesting stories. So the way the chapters are set up, all the record label minutiae is at the back of each chapter. And when you reach that point, there's a green bar in some text saying the rest of this chapter is, you know, record label, trail of area details for those not interested you know, you can skip through the pages or go directly to the next chapter beginning on page whatever. You tap that, it takes you to the next chapter. So you can actually read the book from start to finish without reading any of that information that is going to be interesting to collectors but not to other people. And even collectors, you only are interested in it as a resource to go to it when you need it. So from a reading experience, the digital book, you know, is just really great for that reason it, it yeah and i'm I'm sitting here looking at it it's very well organized and it's very handy to, it's very easy to manipulate mm-hmm. it is and that, you know and that's the key thing and you know of course i know we've been talking and you know and I, like a, a good author i have to say well gee you know, where can you find out about it website's easy it's just beetle b-e-a-t-l-e dot net n-e-t no, you should have made it B E A T T L E. It would have been, but one problem is I wanted a site where if people search Beatles, they'd get my site. And so, right. I, believe me, it had crossed my mind, and I thought, <laughs> let's not get clever and do something stupid from a marketing standpoint. There you go. Right. Although there my you. license plate does say Beetle with two T's. Does it really? Okay. Mm-hmm. And that's in the book, actually. Oh, all right. So, if anybody wants to see what my license plate looks like, it's in the book it's in the book okay there you go. well well this has been great this has been yeah i wish we could go on for another three hours well you just have to have me back to talk about other things and we will absolutely and this is of course as you know a very exciting time with the 50th anniversary of the beatles arrival in america coming up so yeah there's all sorts of fun things in the works mm-hmm. um, there's anniversaries galore mm-hmm. <laughs> yes all right, Bruce, this has been great having you here on the phone with us. And any time you want to come back, you just let us know. This is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying thank you for being with us, Bruce, and we will see you next time. And this is Bruce Spicer saying thanks for listening. I'd love to come back on the show. Had a great time, and uh, check out Beetle.net.